inspiration and imagination. That is what brings about realization. Out of the darkness into the light. I'm a chamber, not out of sight. Looking for direction to get where we want to be. Sixty years ago, a group of Singaporean policymakers visited Kenya to learn about development. Strange to think that just two generations ago, few would have given Singapore, or Asia for that matter, much chance of success. The Southeast Asia region was just emerging from various wars against imperialism then replacing colonial ideas with communist and socialist ideologies. At this point, in the middle of the last century, Asian countries were on average much poorer than their African counterparts. But then, something remarkable happened. Here, illustrated by the famous statistician Hans Rowling. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And so, today Asia is the site of the largest upliftment of people out of poverty ever seen. Whereas the average African's share of the global per capita income has halved to 15% in the last 60 years, this has increased threefold in Southeast Asia to rival the global average. In some countries like Singapore, the wealth is five times the global average, a remarkable turnaround from a situation that looked hopeless in 1965. Our quest is simple, to find out in the next 25 minutes how Asia did it, and if and how can Africa do the same. These questions are asked in the book completed recently by Africa's Brain Trust Foundation, a book which is authored by an unusual team of politicians in the form of President Olusen Obasanjo and former Prime Minister Hail Mariam de Salin and policy analyst Emile Van der Merwe and Dr. Greg Mills. Let's go and find out the answer to the fundamental question which the book poses. China is today perhaps the most notable face for Africans of the scale and reach of Asia's development. The presence of Chinese goods and Chinese stores like the one behind me is a common one in Africa, north, south, east and west. But Asia's development journey started in Japan 150 years ago, a country that we know as the home of famous global brands such as Toyota, Sony, Mitsubishi and Mazda. It was not always that way. Today Japan is unrecognizable from the nation it was just 75 years ago when atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and later Nagasaki, killing nearly a quarter of a million people and flattening the cities. With the war over, Japan quickly set about recovery, not willing to let even this crisis go to waste. The day following its surrender, a committee came together to discuss the country's restoration. There is perhaps no better illustration of the manner in which Japan has continuously innovated and adapted than Mazda, a company which quite literally rose from the devastating ashes of Hiroshima to become a global technology leader. The company is testament to Japan's long-standing foundations of education and an openness to foreign expertise, along with the need for substantial grit and personal hard work. Then, as now, Mazda had its headquarters in Hiroshima's Aki district. Started in 1920, it diverted into rifle production during the Second World War 
like many other large Japanese companies. Its founder, Jujiro Matsuda, celebrated his 70th birthday on the 6th of August 1945, the day the atomic bomb was dropped on the city. Despite losing many workers in the devastation, Mazda restarted production just four months later, living up to what Matsuda saw as Mazda's oath, contributing to the world through manufacturing. Mazda is now the 15th largest car maker globally, producing 1.6 million vehicles in 2019. Like other Japanese car manufacturers, it has lent heavily on foreign ideas, famously in the case of Mazda, attracted to the German Wankel rotary engine design. Unusually, however, Mazda has accommodated also foreign partners, not only in technology sharing, but in management. Today it is pushing once more the technological envelope, with its Hiroshima plant capable of assembling a car every 30 seconds. With such a combination of innovation and pragmatism, and led by the likes of Mazda, Toyota, Suzuki and Honda, Japan was quickly able to rise again from the embers of war, and in so doing, showed the way for others in Asia. The private sector, at the end of the, the previous samurai period, was quite ready to absorb uh, uh, Western civilization, ex particularly technology, uh, and also the, the institutions such as the parliament and constitutions and the joint stock companies, these were very easily absorbed. And so many um, entrepreneurs ready to adapt to such technologies, not only in Tokyo and Osaka and in Nagoya, but all over Japan. I think uh, Japan already had uh, uh, very strong industries at the, the world-class level before the war, and that's one of the reasons we could uh, manage to go to war with the rest of the world. These were the stories uh, of uh, the relatively big companies uh, which were supplying military goods during the wartime, but easily converting their products to commercial uses. Japan's rapid recovery after 1945 provided a clear example of what was possible to other Asian countries. Close neighbors like Korea and Taiwan could now watch, learn and adapt three key words that would come to define the Asian experience. Taiwan is a key player in one of the world's favorite products today, the iPhone. The Apple iPhone as is well documented, made up of components that are sourced mostly from China, South Korea, and Japan. This is captured by the words designed in California, assembled in China, printed in very tiny letters at the back of each iPhone. But what is less known is that Taiwanese farms are the world's leaders in the manufacture of parts for the piece of technology that has quite remarkably changed the world and the way in which we relate to each other. Local high-tech companies collectively and overwhelmingly share of the supply chain for the world's most aspirational phone. This is the story of Taiwan, the subcontractor nation powered by high-tech and facilitated by an environment friendly to investors and ARA and D and focus on turning out a skilled game-changing population. There are over 1.4 million SMEs in Taiwan. Taiwanese businesses benefit from direct government support measures including patent development, industrial parks, trade assistance. This support enables growth and creates success stories like the PC manufacturer Acer who have gone on to be one of the biggest businesses in the world. But Taiwan didn't always start this way. Taiwan's economic transition is one they prefer not to talk of as a miracle. Many put their economic success down to a combination of simple factors, hard work, investing in education, improving skills, a trait of saving rather than spending, and more efficient application of limited resources through often family-run SMEs. Here in Kampala, the narrative is different. 
Every day, highly energized young people with business ideas are not getting the government support they need to grow. By 2025, most Africans will be living in an urban environment. This offers advantages of economies of scale in the delivery of infrastructure and in the supply of a critical mass of labor. Yet one of the things we learned from our travels around Asia is that just providing the hardware of infrastructure, while important, is not enough for development. One aspect that Africa could learn from Asia is in the importance of creating an enabling policy environment for business to get on with what it knows how to do best, how to make a profit, making it easier for the likes of those in a place like Siayanzela behind me to prosper. There could not be a better example of the contrast between old and new Asia than in our next country, Korea. South Korea has become a vibrant modern huge success story, home to Samsung, LG, and of course, the Gangnam Style music. Open Gangnam Style. By comparison, little has changed in its neighbor to the north serving as a stark reminder that development only comes to those who actively pursue an end to business as usual. The links between malignant dictatorship and failure to develop economically and socially are abundantly clear both in Asia and in Africa. Of all of the Asian success stories, perhaps Singapore's turnaround is the most impressive. For many, it is hard to believe that only five decades ago, Singapore looked and operated like this. After attaining their independence, Singaporeans sent a delegation to come and learn from Kenya. When I was a prime minister, I sent a delegation to Singapore to learn. We must understand what happened in the intervening 40 years to change our fortunes so dramatically. 50 years after its separation from Malaysia, in 2015 Singapore's GDP per capita was, at over $50,000, nearly five times greater than Malaysia's, and greater than that, too, of its former colonial master Britain, which it had overtaken 10 years before. Colonial era statues are a source of great controversy as reminders for many of an era of dispossession, humiliation and exploitation. This explains why some prefer to see them removed altogether. Singapore has however today taken another approach. Statues of the founder of modern Singapore, Sir Stamford Raffles, are today retained in prominent places Roads, shops, hospitals, train stations, hotels, and even elite schools are named after the former colonial governor, who even lends his surname to business class in Singapore Airlines. Instead of attempting to discard very painful bits of its colonial history, Singapore has built on its historical foundations, proving in the process that it is possible not to be a prisoner of your past. Week for an official visit to the success of Singapore can largely be credited to the visionary leadership sown by Lee Kuan Yew and his meticulous attention to the details of governance and delivery. What Lee Kuan Yew teaches us is the power of example, like so many other in Asia. I guess you could say Asia is full of good examples of good examples. And that's what Africa needs too. What Lee Kuan Yew did for Asia, as for Singapore, is to show that it's possible to be a strong leader, but to make real change for people and in people's lives. The lessons of Lee Kuan Yew are widely transferable to an African context. And as former Nigerian president and co-author knows only too well. We were invited at my um, instigation by Lin Kuan Yew in 
1993, and I went with about 40 up-and-coming African leaders. And for two days, Lin Kuan Yu and most of the people who have worked with him uh, spent time with us, telling us how they did things and what worked, what did not work. My African brothers and sisters were anxious to get the magic. And on the third day, they wanted uh, Lin Kuan Yu to just give us, look, this is what you do, one thing, and uh, you, you get it right. And um, Lin Kuan Yu came up and said, there's no magic. We did a few things right, and we kept doing them right, widening and deepening them all the time. If leadership is vision, then Joe Studwell believes that the tools to execute that vision are made up of three golden threads, agriculture, manufacturing, and finance. Well, I think uh, there are two obvious basic policy strategies that, um, that unify the Asian experience. And the first one is that Asian governments uh, recognized a simple and in some ways obvious but often ignored fact that the vast majority of people in poor countries live in the countryside and therefore the prioritization of agriculture was the place to begin with policy. Um, East Asia divides obviously into land reform countries and non-land reform countries but whether land reform occurred or it didn't governments almost universally focused a lot of resources um, on the agricultural sector uh, and in all the different ways that you need to focus um, not just on extension or provision of subsidy for fertilizer uh, but also in terms of rural infrastructure to support the creation of markets and so on and so forth. The first lady is only there as a, as a helpmate and someone who is supportive to whatever... One of the most telling lessons from the Asian development story is that countries that have failed to emulate the success of the likes of Japan, South Korea and Singapore are those where political corruption and weak institutions are still prevalent. Political corruption is something we are only too aware of here in Africa and the impact it has on society. But in Asia, even when there have been a high-profile corruption scandal, the strength of institutions has always prevailed. Nowhere has this been more evident than in Vietnam. There's no country in the world which has suffered more than Vietnam has. It was occupied by four countries, China, France, Japan, and the United States for more than a thousand years. It suffered more than three million war dead and had more bombs dropped on it than were released by all sides during the Second World War. It has a long, discontiguous geography, a selection of weak neighbors, and a very difficult topography. Take it from me, I once cycled from the north to the south. And then to cap it all, faced with a mammoth task of reconstruction and rebuilding the country, after reunification in 1975, the communist government imposed a command economic system, which resulted in shortages of basic goods, including the local staple, rice. Then in 1985, the government changed. It reformed through its doi moi policies or renovation, letting the market essentially into the economy. The result is 35 years of high growth and a rapid improvement in the standard of living of more than 100 million Vietnamese. Instead of a shortage of basic goods, it's now the world's second largest rice and coffee exporter and is a major manufacturer of consumer goods from motorbikes to electronics. And its old enemy, the United States, is now a strategic ally. Essentially, Vietnam used policy and openness to stage a second liberation, this time from economic hardship and from bad policy choices.
about China, which transformed itself from an insular country to the global economic powerhouse that it is today. China's disastrous economic and social experiments of the 1960s demonstrated the cost of having too much state and too little market. Its subsequent and rapid transformation from poverty to prosperity has since become the great global economic success story of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. But it did not attempt everything at once. In learning lessons from others in Asia and also from Mauritius, China opened up through own crates. It did not happen all at once. China also did not dip 800 million people out of poverty in one stroke. It took time and a prioritization. It started with Shanghai and a coastal region. They came other cities like Shenzhen. From this start came the widespread and a rapid development we see today. Asia's development has not been without its challenges, not least the implications on climate change and human rights. It's worth remembering that developments in China and elsewhere in Asia came at an environmental cost. Africa must avoid these pitfalls in using its rich store of natural endowments in a sustainable fashion. Africa now has the benefit of experience to cherry pick only the positive aspects of Asia's growth while forging a new path for herself. Our little journey around Asia has demonstrated what is possible and should give hope to all of Africa. If it is possible for a communist government burdened by a history of disastrous policies and with more than one billion people to feed, one can create economic success, then there's no reason that Africa cannot. The message from Asia is as clear as it should be inspiring. Transformation is possible. So what's Asia's big lesson for Africa? Asia teaches us that with better leadership choices, Africa can have a very different future. Asia teaches us that by embracing the private sector, Africa can lift its citizens out of poverty and create wealth. Asia teaches us not to be the prisoners of the past. Of course, we should look forward and acknowledge the impact of the past, but we shouldn't be bound in it. Most importantly, use a crisis. Crisis should be used as an opportunity and we shouldn't miss it. Asia tells us that sustained success comes from getting the basics right, prudence and prioritization. Asia shows us time and time again, whether or not we succeed or fail is primarily our responsibility and not that of outsiders, and is also a consequence of the better choices that Africa makes. Africa is full of potential and opportunities. If we support, invest, and travel locally, we help build the future, and whether or not we succeed, it falls entirely on us. On the We're gonna make a plan anyway. All aboard on the Jambo Express. Make it last, culture and hope, 
I know a place to go. Turning on the track, never turning back. Leaders on the toes, yo. We need no superheroes. All aboard, put up a boat. All aboard, on the Jungle Express. All aboard, put up a boat. All aboard, on the Jungle Express. How long it takes, we cannot say. We're gonna make a plan anyway. All aboard, on the Jungle Express. Oh, yeah. On the Jungle Express. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. On the Jungle Express. 